Welcome once again to Word on the Hills with me, Chris Cameron, my co-host, Felicity Sidney reed and our guest this week, historian Dan Buchanan, who joins us by Zoom. Each week, we visit with authors, editors, or publishers who have regional or local connections. We hope to find out a little about their lives, what prompts them to write, and give them an opportunity to read some of their work for us. And we're very pleased to have Dan Buchanan with us again today. Welcome, Dan. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Dan is known as the History Guy of Brighton, and he's engaged in many activities related to local and Ontario history. He's a frequent speaker to historical and social organizations, the author of three books, and the founder of Brighton History Week. In July 2015, Dan published his first book, Murder in the Family, the Dr. King story, which tells the fascinating true story of Brighton's infamous murder case in 1859. In June of 2018, his second book, 38 Hours to Montreal, was released, telling the unique story of William Weller's record-breaking sleigh ride from Toronto to Montreal in 1840. His third book will be published in August 2020, entitled The Wreck of HMS Speedy, The Tragedy That Shook Upper Canada. Dan is a founder of the annual Brighton History Week. Since 2000, he's done community genealogy research and provides the details at treesbydan.com. He has a database of well over 100,000 individuals radiating out from his own families, which settled in the north end of Brighton Township. Well, that's quite a resume, Dan. <laughs> Maybe we could start perhaps by getting you to tell us a bit about your new book, uh, The HMS Speedy. The wreck of the HMS Speedy is a well-known story locally. Why did you decide to research and write about this topic particularly? Yes, the story of the Speedy is local lore around Brighton. I grew up with it. This book came about for a very particular reason. Fall of 2018, I came into possession of a box of documents. They were the papers of Ed Burt, the professional diver of Belleville, who did the exploration out in the lake in the early 1990s. Uh, unfortunately, Ed passed away in fall of 2017, and his family uh, gave me his documents with the idea that uh, the story might be revealed in sort of a reasonable sense. I'd worked with Ed before that. So uh, that was kind of the choice made for me. Uh, my third book was going to be about the speed. The story's been written up so many times over the years. I counted well over 45, but mostly as a newspaper article or a magazine article on a small scale. So it was a book in, 20, in 1992, um, Speedy Justice, which was um, taking the legal standpoint. But I wanted to do it in the way I've learned how to do a history story, and that is based on the original documents, the documents from the time. Once I got researching, it just became such an interesting story because there's lots of documents about that time period. And it's a time period we don't know much about, 1804. It's that period in between the uh, War of Independence when the UALs came and uh, then the uh, War of 1812. So look at our history, we think nothing happened in that period, but that's not true. It's a fascinating developmental period. Half the fun must have been setting it against the backdrop of that time period as well. I had, uh... The focus is around York, of course, which is now Toronto. And in 1804, it was only a decade old. They were just beginning to set up the basic infrastructure for government. There was probably 450 people lived in York at that time. So a small place. You know, everybody would know everybody else. And when you read up the history uh, in the various um, documents we have, uh, you hear the same names come up pretty routinely. It was interesting to see the context of 1804 in the sense of the uh, Indigenous history as well understanding the conflicts that were happening at that time. The settlers had really just started to come in the previous decade, and it sat along the north. A couple of concessions about the north, the first couple of concessions, the surveying hadn't even been done. Uh, it was still kind of the wilderness uh, at that time, where fur trading went on. Can you elaborate a little bit more on some of the sources that you went after to, uh, yes. to, to get this information? The biggest source was the British military records. These are on a website on the um, Library and Archives Canada website. That's a tremendous resource. It was one of those that I wasted a lot of time there because you just got to look at the next page, you know. Um, but I found hundreds of documents there that related to the Speedy. This was the records of the provincial marine. This was the letters going back between Kingston and York about the repair and the building of ships and the discipline of soldiers, the um, ship captains coming in and going. Uh, 
storms that damaged ships and how they needed to repair that kind of day in and day out activity. You know, I wanted to understand that from the standpoint of being able to understand what the speedy, what the speedy was and the context it was in that led up to its demise, basically. And it's also helps with the people understanding who the people were that we were dealing with. And uh, the politics of the time uh, are very well documented. And that lends very much into why the speedy sailed to begin with. So that was important to find out. In terms of York, the town of York, early history of the town of York, you've got to look at the landmarks of Toronto. It's a huge set of documents that have references to original newspaper reports from the time. Uh, and that is all now in digital form, so you can cross-reference and search and it's tremendous resource. There's many others, but those are the two main ones. I can hear the excitement in your voice when you're talking about it. I know it is one when you're researching something like this, one thing leads to the next, and before you know it, you're you're off on a tangent somewhere. It's about time now if I can ask you to read to us from sure. the wreck of HMS Speedy. The first reading is from chapter eight called The Ship and the Captain, um, page uh, 70. This is about a week before the Speedy sails. Um, Lieutenant Governor Hunter and his military secretary, James Green, are stepping outside Parliament House, which is at the east end of the shoreline of York, and they're looking down the shore to see what ship is there at the garrison, which is by Fort York today. So here we go. Hunter and Green gazed down the shoreline and took notice of a ship being tied up at the small wharf at the garrison. Looking more closely with his spyglass, Hunter confirmed it was HMS Speedy, one of His Majesty's arms, armed vessels on Lake Ontario. The flurry of preparations going on around Europe regarding the trial of Agatonica had, by this time, focused on the very practical issue of transportation. The fall diseases were scheduled to begin at Newcastle on October 10th, so the contingent of officials, assistants, witnesses, plus the constables, and of course the accused, must leave York no later than the 7th. During the last week of September, several of the ships that were active on the lake at this time came and went according to their normal habits. Now, only a week before the planned departure for Newcastle, it was time to select a ship for this special duty. Setting down his spyglass, Hunter shook his head in a gesture that said, Oh dear. The two men looked at each other and grimaced. HMS Beatty was one of several British gunboats that plied the Great Lakes at this time. They were built and managed by the Provincial Marine, the organization that represented the British Navy and the British North American colonies. Many of the ship captains and sailors in those ships came out of the British Navy by one half or another, but the organization was commanded by the British Army, which was headquartered in Quebec City. Hunter knew HMS Speedy as the vessel that had delivered him to York in August of 1799 amid ceremony and celebration. It was a typical workhorse of the Provincial Marine. Government officials and military officers, tra officers traveled between Kingston and York on these ships. And at the same time, decks were piled high with all kinds of cargo. Launched at Kingston in the fall of 1798, at the same time as the identical HMS Swift, the Speedy was a modest gunboat, about 55 feet long, with twin masts. Hunter recalled that the launch of both ships had been delayed several months in order to build an extra two feet of height on the sides of the deck. The demand for shipping space was growing every year, and this modification was done to increase the tonnage carried by each ship. Unfortunately, it would also make them difficult to sail in rough water. As he squinted again, again through the spyglass, Hunter had the unsettling feeling that both he and HMS Speedy were a bit worse for wear. His gout was a persistent annoyance, and the long-standing stomach ailments he had picked up in the tropics made him crankier than normal. The ship was at the end of a stormy sailing season and had a sad, ragged appearance. What Hunter remembered about his trips in this conveyance was the discomfort of traveling with meager passenger comforts. The Toronto yacht, which he much preferred for his trips across the lake, had a private cabin that he appreciated. Knowing the history of HMS Speedy, neither Hunter nor Green would have willingly chosen it for the Newcastle trip. In the fall of 1804, it was six years old and nearing the end of its useful life. Its construction had followed the common practice of the Provincial Marine at the time, using timber that was uncured or green. This resulted in high maintenance and a short lifespan. In 1795, the Duke of La roche bachard had noted, all these vessels are built of timber fresh cut down and not seasoned, and for this reason, 
last never longer than six or eight years. To preserve them, even to this time, requires a thorough repair. Nothing much had changed in a decade. In fact, the, the British military naval records held in the collection of the Library and Archives Canada show there were plans afoot to repair the Speedy that fall in the hope that it might gain one more shipping season before it would have to be replaced. This kind of major refit, refit was repeated every winter for these ships in order to make sure they would be ready for the next sailing season. Normally, the cargo carried by a Speedy and other vessels of the provincial marine were very mundane. On April 17, 1804, Lieutenant Earl wrote from Kingston that, I intend to load the Speedy this week with peas to go on to Amherstburg. A request came from Kingston on August 13, 1801 asked to forward 50 bushels of Indian corn for the use of His Majesty's service. I have ordered Lieutenant Axton to take them on board the Speedy. A year later, the cargo may have been somewhat more anticipated when the Speedy, after receiving some repairs, is now receiving a cargo of port on board for the upper country. Thanks so much, Dan. And now we'll take a short break. Welcome back to Bird on the Hills with me, Felicity Sidnall-Reed, my co-host, Chris Cameron, and our guest this week, historian Dan Buchanan. So Dan, your new book is scheduled to be released in August 2020. Will the launch be very different this year because of COVID, do you think? Well, it, it will be very different, like everything we're doing. Um, yes, I had at least two dozen events already planned by March for the release in the middle of the summer, and that all got changed, changed over to be virtual, and uh, we are creating virtual events, and I will be basically sitting in my living room for, for almost all of them. I, I think the only in-person thing I'll be doing that I know about for sure is the Coddington Farmer's Market. And once a month this summer, I'll be there. Tell us about the P Brighton History Weekend that you founded some years ago now. Last February, we had our eighth annual event. Who knows what happens this coming year. The focus of this event is the open house, which is usually had it held at the end of the weekend on a Saturday now. Yes, it's always at the community center in Brighton. People in the area who are displaying history, the various museums, several of us uh, historians, and some uh, folks who do heritage-related uh, demonstrations and things. And how many people turn up and say they want to be added to your trees? Explain the concept of genealogy. How did you get into it? Well, I've always been a history buff, and I spent most of my life reading history. And I, later in the 90s, I got uh, kind of tired of that and thought I wanted to do something more direct. And I started to look at my own family tree and uh, saw what the software was like and that there were internet tools available. And once I got involved in that, it was like a drug. It was like an obsession. I couldn't get away from it. And it just grew and grew and grew. After a few years, when I looked at my database, I started to see it as just another way to see local history. And so that just grew. And of course, I was in the wave of interest for that. And it was all around the world. Uh, I became a, a regular on Ancestry. In 2004, I put my own database up. And when people can see the data, they sometimes email me about corrections, sometimes additions. I get whole branches of the family of Somebody that was here in the 1840s and moved to Michigan, I get a whole branch of that family from somebody who's seen it and wants to add to it. Even now when I do my books, when I, I choose a story to do in a book, the first research I do is to choose, find all the people and do the family trees for those people. It, it's like therapy to me. I can spend all day doing the history work, which is like sometimes brain numbing, especially if you're in editing and things like that. But then I can sit down and do two, three hours of genealogy and I'm good to go. Well, it can certainly take up a great deal of time, I know, from the little that I do. So, please read some more to us from the wreck of the HMS Speedy. This is in part two about the search for the Speedy. Um, it's just as Ed Bird is getting his project underway. The license and funding applications were 
uh, bore fruit in April 1990 as preparations were underway to make sure the equipment and crew were ready to take advantage of the first good weather. Unfortunately, Mother Nature was not cooperative, and so the crew's first day in the lake was not until the middle of June. They began their survey work with the objective of locating the items shown in the video. And I referred to a video that Ed took in 1989 that showed him articles on the bottom of the lake that he thought might be from an old ship. Between June and October that year, uh, Bert and his crew spent 19 days out on the lake. Terry Coons, Bert's, uh, Bert's childhood friend and a professional diver who acquired his training with the U.S. Navy, was the chief diver for the project, as well as a director with the HMS Beauty Foundation. Coons was responsible for managing the dives and the divers, and he did the bulk of the diving himself. A remotely operated video camera would record images onto tape, and when items were of interest were identified, the divers went down to find the item and take close-up underwater photographs. Of course, while this was going on, safety was top of mind for everyone. Diving in the rough and cloudy waters of Lake Ontario could be dangerous, but these experienced divers had the right equipment and lots of experience, which sometimes meant that you abort the dive in the face of high waves and gusting wind. Everything was based on the weather. For the divers, it was grueling work. In periods of good weather, when there were successive days of diving, fatigue could be a problem that needed to be managed. The best weather in 1990 was later in July and through August. During this time, Coons shed body weight at an alarming rate due to the intense constant and constant diving. Some days he was called upon a dozen or more times to go down and check out interesting shapes that had been captured on video. It was exciting to dive on a potentially historic wreck, but there was also tedious days that bore no positive results, such as the life of a professional diver. Despite the spring's high hopes, as fall approached, nothing related to the Speedy had been found. A grid layout kept the work organized, ensuring that they did not search the same area by mistake. While the results they sought were not appearing, the survey work continued. The high point for 1990 came at the very end of the season on October 14th. They had moved to another square on the grid, and in very short order, we're seeing familiar shapes from the first video. There was another anchor. There was an anchor, pieces of timber, a chain, cannonballs, pulleys, and more. Finally, they had located the debris field, a term Ed Burt would use from this point forward. They were able to go out again on October 20th, and they saw more of the same things in the same general area. This was the last diving for 1990 and Ed Burt was very relieved to have something to show for a summer of intense work. He was even, even more excited about what they might find next year. Ken Cassavoy had been a supervising um, marine archeologist for the project during the 1990 season. He completed his responsibilities by writing a report outlining the genesis of the project and the activity that took place that season. He also submitted an article for the Ontario Archaeological Report in 1991, which said that the results of the 1990 season had been inconclusive. He added, however, that promising sightings had occurred late in the season, and given the historical importance of the Speedy, work should continue. Cassavoy did not return to the project in 1991 because of the many demands on his time and his belief that he had not seen enough evidence to support the theory that Bert and his crew had found the remains of HMS Speedy. He indicated he would be happy to return to more, uh, if more definitive evidence was found. But in the meantime, there were other projects to work on. This would have significant consequences. It would cause a change in the terms of the archeological licenses issued by the ministry for the Speedy project. The rules for handling underwater artifacts took into consideration the experience and expertise of the licensee. With a professional marine archaeologist as the licensee in 1990, the license said they were allowed to retrieve limited number of artifacts for the purpose of identifying the ship. Unfortunately, the debris field was not located until the end of the season, so retrieving artifacts to identify the ship was not yet possible, even if the license allowed for it. The license for 1991 
was taken out by Ed Burke, who was not a certified archaeologist. As a result, the underwater survey clause uh, in the license read, retrieval of artifacts from underwater sites is not covered under this license. The practical impact of this was to prevent Ed and his crew from retrieving any artifacts, even if they found items that would be useful in identifying the ship. These restrictions were designed to protect underwater artifacts from destruction by careless divers and treasure hunters. In this case, however, they had the effect of putting the speedy project in an impossible situation. If the identity of this ship was not yet confirmed, the professional archaeologist would not be inclined to pursue the project. On the other hand, if artifacts could not be retrieved, then the ship would not likely be identified. It was a classic catch-22. I see that it's really, really complicated. How, how does a person who isn't qualified uh, get licensed? Well, it's very complicated, as you say. Um, they will offer licenses to anyone who can mount a project, but the rules of that license control what they can do. Well, thank you so much, Dan, for coming in and talking about your new book and some of your other projects. Where will our listeners be able to buy the wreck of the HMS Speedy, the tragedy that shook Upper Canada? In all bookstores. I am glad to say that the Indigo people, the largest bookseller in Canada, love this book. It will be distributed across the country um, with lots of promotion in store and online. Plus, of course, your local bookstores. I encourage people to support your local bookstores. Um, mm -hmm. It will be widely available and um, in the news uh, in August around when the time it comes yeah. out. So I'm grateful for that. I don't know what that means exactly, but um, hopefully a lot of people will see this story. And it will be available online too, you said, right? All the various sites, ebook, ebook version, and actually even in the process of producing a video with the story as well. Well, to connect with us, listeners, please send comments, queries, or suggestions for who we might interview in future programs to our website, wordonthehills.com, where all our broadcasts are archived. We love to hear from you and welcome your comments on our programs. Thanks for tuning in to the show. We hope you'll join us for another program next week on Northumberland 89.7, Truly Local Radio. Thank you.